This week in Linux, we've got some new distro releases with Manjaro 26 and Nitrix 5.1. Plus, we got some good news for our Linux gamers from NVIDIA. Yes, that NVIDIA. Plus, I have a really cool app to tell you about called EasySpeak, which lets you control your Linux desktop with your voice. I know, right? All of this and more on This Week in Linux, the weekly news show that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world. Now let's jump right into your source for Linux good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Sandfly Security. More on them later. The Manjaro team have announced Manjaro 26, codename and Lin, I think. This release comes with updates to the desktop stacks and a continued shift toward Wayland. At the core of this release, we have an update to the Linux kernel with Linux 6.18 LTS being included. The three flagship editions have all been updated. XFCE is of course shipping with the XFCE 4.20 version, although this one has a lot of updates. There's, XFCE hasn't had a new release in a while, but there's been a lot of components being updated and included in this version is updates to those components. KDE Plasma Edition has been updated to KDE Plasma 6.5, and the GNOME Edition has been updated to GNOME 49. One of the more notable changes in this release is that Manjaro now defaults to Wayland for its primary desktop environments. Well, more specifically, the GNOME and KDE editions. Uh, GNOME have announced they will be removing X11 support in GNOME 50, and KDE have laid out a plan to move away from X11 sometime in 2027 with Plasma 6.8. Other distros have already made this switch to being focused on Wayland, and for those uh, users who are upgrading from older installations, this can change the default session uh, because, well, depending on your desktop environment and the graphics setup, and that might cause some issues, so just keep that in mind. In the release notes, the majority of what is listed is related to what is new in the specific desktops like GNOME 49 and KDE Plasma 6.5. So if you want to learn more about those specific releases of those desktops, check out episode 328 of This Week in Linux, where I covered those desktop releases. Although there has been some community discussion around Manjaro's SSL certificate issue affecting their forum, uh, while this is not directly tied to the 26 release, it is kind of weird to see their SSL certs expire again. I think this is like the third, maybe fourth time, at least third time. So anyway, you should t do something about that, Manjaro. But Manjaro 26 is relatively straightforward update focused on keeping pace with upstream development and newer kernels. Uh, but there's not much specific beyond the updates to components. There's not really anything specific to like Manjaro uh, only thing. It's mostly updates to packages and desktops and that sort of stuff. So if you want to learn more, I'll have links in the show notes for the latest release of Manjaro, but also links to the desktops that have been updated based on this release. Last week, I featured a new distro that was made for accessibility. And this time, I have a new app for you. This app does something really cool that a lot of people have wanted for a long time, and that is real voice control of your system. This project is called EasySpeak, and the goal here is awesome. Let you control your PC with your voice without relying on cloud services or proprietary platforms. EasySpeak was made by a friend of the show, Matt Hartley, and it is built around offline speech recognition so your voice commands are processed locally instead of being sent off to a server. That immediately makes it more compelling from most mainstream voice assistants, especially when it comes to privacy and latency. Once it's set up, you can issue commands to launch apps, control windows, trigger scripts, and automate common desktop actions like just clicking around through a grid control, and you have all of this just by speaking. The demo walks through basic navigation, application launching, and command execution, all happening without an internet connection. EasySpeak is still under active development and is in early stages of the project, but the demo already shows a ton of great promise. Setup currently involves installing dependencies and configuring command mapping, so it's more targeted at Linux users who are comfortable tweaking their system. That said, the core functionality is already there, and the project is fully free and open source. The goal is to eventually have it available for you know, easy ease of use, but right now it's still in the very early stages of development. The fact that this is happening in a Linux native offline first way 
I mean, for accessibility use cases, power users, or anyone who wants voice automation of their system, this is one of the coolest attempts that I've seen so far. Matt was describing this to me, and I thought it would be cool to see this happen eventually, but then he showed me the demo, and I was shocked because it's already very powerful, and the fact that he's building it to support plugins, so in theory, it could be integrated with anything in your system. This has a ton of potential, and I can't wait to see what happens with this project in the future. And uh, be sure to subscribe, because I'll let you know what happens. The Nitrix team has rolled out its 5.x series, with the latest version being Nitrix 5.1. This was a release that I've been looking forward to for quite some time, because they have, they have some very interesting stuff here. Nitrix 5.0 kicked things off with a major desktop and architectural shift, and 5.1 doubles down on that direction. Starting with Nitrix 5.0, they officially moved away from a highly customized KDE Plasma desktop to a highly customized Hyperlan desktop and experience. And Nitrix 5.1 ships with a modern kernel with Linux 6.18 LTS on a Debian base. Nitrix is continuing to position itself as a systemd free distro using OpenRC instead, but another big change for this release is that they introduced new and updated tooling aligned with an immutable style design. This means that this new version of Nitrix comes with atomic updates, containerized application delivery, and a locked down base system that's meant to reduce breakage and drift over time. Nitrix is also unique in that it has the app image format as the main format used for getting apps. But not to worry for those who like flat packs, because Nitrix 5 also includes support for flat packs and DistroBox. So if something you want is not available as an app image, you can still have access to them through those methods. Something else interesting that Nitrix did was that in Nitrix 5.1, they've decided to drop support for using Nitrix as a virtual machine. The developers state that Nitrix is now intended to run only on bare metal. That means no official support for VirtualBox, QEMU, or other VM setups, which is pretty uncommon in a, as a stance for the Linux space. Now, technically speaking, you could probably get it to work, but it's not going to be supported anymore officially. The reasoning from Nitrix team is that supporting virtual machines adds complexity and compromises the performance and assumptions that they want to make about the system. By focusing purely on bare metal installs, they believe they can better control stability, uh, hardware integration, and the overall user experience. Now, what's interesting here is that Nitrix is also not trying to appeal to everyone. It's a highly opinionated, immutable, systemd-free distro built around Hyperlan and bare metal usage only. They also specifically say that Nitrix is not for everyone and that is intentional. If you want to learn more about why, I'll have a link to the whole uh, release notes for that. But for users who align with that vision, this is a very compelling option. Hyperland is pretty popular these days, and having it mixed with a stable Debian base and an immutable style approach, I mean, if that sounds good to you, then it's definitely worth giving it a look. As Linux users, we know what's up. Security is non-negotiable, but with threats evolving faster than ever, your security tools need to keep pace, without dragging your system down, of course. And traditional agents, while well, they slow you down, they create stability risks, it's time for a smarter approach, and that's why This Week in Linux is proud to be sponsored by Sandfly Security, the agentless security platform designed for Linux. Sandfly doesn't just detect and respond, it transforms security with SSH key tracking, password auditing, and drift detection, covering threats from every angle. Whether your systems are in the cloud, on-premises, or in embedded devices, Sandfly ensures they're all secure without the headaches of agent-based solutions. And if your company is interested in transforming your security strategy, Sandfly also offers free trials to show off what it can do for your business. So visit thisweekinlinux.com slash Sandfly to do that. And also listen to what Timothy Lisko, the deputy CISO at DigitalOcean has to say. Sandfly is one of the most exciting pieces of security tech I've seen recently. We're excited to not only be a customer, but also offer an integrated solution to our customers through DigitalOcean Marketplace. This technology addresses Linux security in a really novel and compelling way. So experience security that's like, effective, but it also gives you peace of mind. No agents, no downtime, just cutting edge protection. 
Dive into the future of Linux security at thisweekinlinux.com slash sandfly. That's thisweekinlinux.com slash S-A-N-D-F-L-Y and see how Sandfly can transform your security strategy. NVIDIA announced some stuff at CES 2026. But the thing that I was most interested in is about GeForce Now. Because for a long time, Linux users who wanted to play games on GeForce Now had to use a browser-based method. But NVIDIA just announced they are bringing native GeForce Now client to Linux. The Linux app is meant to deliver better performance and lower latency compared to previous browser-based method. NVIDIA is positioning this as a proper desktop client with tighter integration and fewer limitations, which has been a long-standing request from Linux gamers. NVIDIA also revealed DLSS 4.5, which adds dynamic multi-frame generation. This is an evolution of DLSS frame generation that adjusts how frames are generated in real time based on workload and performance conditions instead of using a fixed strategy. Plus, NVIDIA's DLSS updater tool is gaining Linux support. This allows games to receive newer DLSS versions without waiting for full game updates, which has traditionally been a Windows-only feature. So that closes a pretty visible gap in feature parity for this updater. GeForce Now has actually already shown results on devices like the Steam Deck when running through a browser, and native Linux client could certainly improve things. And then when you add on the DLSS updater for Linux, this is some really good updates and news from NVIDIA. It's nice to see NVIDIA actually doing things for Linux these days. And I hope it continues. IceWM has reached version 4.0, and this release of this lightweight window manager brings a set of refinements and improvements. The project continues to focus on the speed and low resource usage, but there are some user visible changes worth noting here. The most noticeable update in IceWM 4.0 is the improved alt tab window switcher. The switcher has been reworked to be more consistent and readable, making it easier to identify open windows when cycling through them and this addresses one of the more commonly interacted with parts of the interface without changing the overall feel of IceWM. Beyond that, IceWM 4.0 includes a variety of smaller usability and visual improvements. These include uh, tweaks to window handling behavior, menu handling, and theme-related adjustments. None of these are radical changes, but they aim to add some polish and smoothness to the experience. Under the hood, there are also some fixes and cleanups that improve stability and maintainability. IceWM continues to be a popular choice for older hardware and users who prefer a minimal window manager that just stays out of the way. IceWM is not trying to compete with modern compositing desktops with like flashy effects or that kind of thing. It's focused on being fast, predictable, and lightweight. And this release keeps that philosophy intact while polishing some of the most frequently used parts of the experience. There's some interesting things happening with the Valve hardware survey. Initially, Valve's Steam hardware and software survey for December 2025 showed Linux at 3.19%. But Valve has recently amended the results, and after the correction, Linux actually hit an all-time high share on the platform. After the revision, Linux usage on Steam now sits at 3.58%. That might sound small in absolute terms, but in the context of Steam's massive user base, even tenths of a percent represents a large number of active users. This also means that Linux usage went up by 0.38% in December, in December alone. And in fact, this is an all-time high for the Steam survey for Linux. And around the same time, Valve has also been continuing work on Linux-related platform improvements, including changes to uh, SteamOS-related stuff and kernel-level features like NT-Sync. Now, NT-Sync is basically to help accelerate uh, Windows NT synchronization primitives. And what that means basically is that NT Sync is intended to improve synchronization performance for Windows games running under Proton. And it directly targets long-standing bottlenecks in certain workloads. And the latest SteamOS beta now includes the NT Sync kernel driver. So we've got some kernel level improvements, we've got some SteamOS improvements, and a lot of stuff coming out of Valve, which is awesome. And also, it turns out that the amount of people playing games on Linux in Steam is higher than we thought, which is always nice. And hopefully it gets even more and more people using it because you know the more people using Linux, the better the platform gets, and I'm all for that. Cache OS is expanding beyond its desktop focus and is officially planning a dedicated server edition. 
Cache EOS, for those that don't know, is based on Arch Linux, and they have a lot of customizations and modifications for performance and that sort of stuff, including things to the kernel. According to the project, the server edition will be minimal by design. The goal is to strip out desktop-specific tooling and provide a clean and performance-oriented base that still benefits from Cache EOS optimizations. This includes the same kernel and performance tuning approach Cache OS is known for, but applied to server workloads instead of gaming or desktop responsiveness. Now, the Cache OS team has framed this as a natural extension of the project rather than a pivot. They've pointed out that, that many users already run Cache OS components in servers and containers, and a formal server edition would make that use case easier to manage and support. Now, it's still Arch based, so it keeps the rolling release model but with defaults that make more sense for servers and are customized by Cache EOS. Now, the details are still limited at this stage. There's no release date yet, and the developers have said that this is early planning stage right now, but it is quite interesting to see this kind of addition being added to the Cache EOS project. They've emphasized that stability, documentation, and sensible defaults are important to this project, and that sounds really good to me. Although being based on Arch is not something you typically see for a server distro, or because server and enterprise usage typically want slower update cadence, just so there is less to do on the server. A lot of times people want a set it and forget it type of experience for servers, so I'm very interested to see how the Cache EOS team is going to handle this new server edition. If Cache EOS server could sit in an interesting space for users who want like an arch style flexibility combined with pre-tuned performance for like a server environment, I mean, this could be really interesting to see. Be sure to subscribe to This Week in Linux as I'll keep you updated for when this new edition comes out. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. And if you'd like to support the show and the channel, then consider becoming a patron by going to tugsdigital.com slash membership where you get a bunch of cool perks like access to the patron only section of our discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux Silver t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt, which is the one I'm wearing right now at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, and stickers, and more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell, and until next time, I bid you farewell.